Before we get into the workshop, I just wanted to take a minute to tell you a little bit about the Compost Learning Hub. This is a project um, near and dear to our hearts at YRFN, a place where folks can learn about various styles of compost um, through demonstration garden that we are putting together. It will offer educational workshops like this one, and um, it will be on, they'll be on topics that range from compost to seed saving to water conservation, as well as waste reduction. Um, the initiative itself provides opportunities for folks to connect with um, nature and use compost as a way to reduce their impact on the environment. And as soon as we're able to, fingers crossed, we'll be opening the space for in-person tours. But until then, we'll continue to offer these type of online workshops. So for more information on this and um, any of our workshop lineups, you can check the chat because we're gonna put up our webpage as well as um, our email list and you're welcome to sign up for that. So um, although we may be connecting right now virtually, um, due to COVID, I do encourage all uh, fellow settlers to take a moment and reflect on the history of the land that you are currently tuning in from. And we do this with the acknowledgement of the intertwining legacies of settler colonialism and the transatlantic slave trade. Myself, I'm currently on Williams Treaty and Treaty 3 territory in Aurora here. Uh, which is traditionally cared for by the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe peoples. Um, we have our neighbors, the Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nation, as our closest Indigenous community, and they're about an hour and 15 minutes northeast of us over here. Um, so in the same way that we, that learning a person's name is a very necessary first step in developing a relationship with them, Land acknowledgements can be the vital first step in learning who lived and continues to live on this land. But first steps need to be followed up by many more steps and many more actions. So in that light, um, some questions that I've been asking myself and that I wanna share with you are, what does it mean to be a treaty person? What are principles and responsibilities that we have in relation to each other as human beings and to this land that sustain us? How can we show our appreciation um, to the land through our everyday actions? So as we get into the content of this hot composting workshop, let's continually investigate and bring to the forefront these questions. So without any further delay, let me introduce you to our facilitator today, Sean Smith. You can wave. Sean is the head proprietor and brewer of Crooked Farms. <coughs> Sorry, he is originally from Kingston, Ontario, but I'm gonna just take a sip. <coughs> Sorry about that, John. Ah, oh, that's better. <laughs> <laughs> He's originally from Kingston, Ontario, but has been growing vegetables in East York um, for the past 17 years. His interest in developing a local CSA for composting and compost tea brewing emerges from deep underlying concerns about soil health, microbial life, climate change, and a relationship <clears throat> with land and water. In 2019, Sean won first place in the DIY innovation category in the best in GROWTO, Urban Gardening Competition for Improvements to an Urban Composting Method. And he repeated this in 2020 in the Professional Innovation Category with an, in, in, sorry, with an inexpensive design for a scalable compost tea brewer. In spring 2020, Crooked Farms won a Landscape Ontario Horticultural Trade, Trades Association bursary. Say that fast a few times. <laughs> to, to, Develop compost tea workshop resources in the GTA. And Sean has received awards for entrepreneurial distinction from Acadia University and the University of Alberta, and was recently profiled by the website Humans Who Grow Food, which is also going to be in our chat if you want to learn a little bit more about that. So, Sean, thank you so much for joining us, and I will let you take it from here. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Marissa. Um, and thank everybody for coming today. I know these Zoom workshops are um, a real interesting way of getting together. Um, 
and I, I look at the careful grids of faces here and I look at the uncareful rows of vegetables I have planted out back, which is where the name Crooked Farms come from. I can never plant a straight row for my entire life. And so uh, I've got these juxtapositions here, your very careful grid-like faces and my very unkempt um, rows of vegetables outside. Thank you for coming, I really appreciate it. Um, and hopefully, hopefully today there's something a little here for you. Um, it's a very particular aspect of composting that we're going to look at today. Um, uh, a hot composting, uh, what's known um, more historically as the California method. And uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the California method and just some a few little tweaks I've done at home to, uh, to help trying to do it in urban contexts. Um, before we begin, I'd like to uh, show a quick clip uh, that maybe illustrates a bit of my passion for this and, and why uh, I've gotten into it. Um, some of you may be familiar with the filmmaker Jamie Day Fleck, who lives in Toronto, uh, who's a, also a gardener in Toronto and a documentary filmmaker. And she is working on a documentary for release this fall called In My Backyard about some of the different people doing um, urban agriculture projects in the city of Toronto. Um, and she's also made little trailers about some of the characters that appear in this film or will be appearing in the film. Um, and Dallin, if you could go ahead, uh, we'll have a look at the one about Crooked Farms. <laughs> We had terrible soil, kind of a very dead backyard. And so I began working with compost and compost tea to remediate my own space here. This is where we make our compost for the compost tea at Crooked Farms. We use the compost that we make on hand here to brew our compost tea. The key element is to have a vigorous pump, pumping oxygen through your different brews. The compost tea we make here at Crooked Farms is considered actively aerobic. We are feeding the compost that is in the brewer oxygen and a sugar so that the microbes that are in the compost will feed on the sugar and be fostered in the oxygenated environment and multiply. The aerobic bacteria that proliferate in that kind of a drink are the ones that we want to get into our soil. I'm hoping to achieve a bit of a shared cognition in the community that there are alternatives to chemical pesticides and fertilizers. So thank you for that, Dallin. And uh, thank you to Jamie for permission to share um, this video here today and, and going forward. Uh, her, her movie will be coming out this fall in my backyard. Um, so I'd like to follow up something Marissa started with her acknowledgement and that was uh, uh, talking about land acknowledgement and action. Um, and for us with Crooked Farms and, and which is really myself personally, Crooked Farms is like another alter ego in many ways. Uh, it offers me an opportunity, especially through the, the, the act and the process of, of composting, of really unlearning and relearning some things about uh, land, water, um, uh, land sovereignty, indigenous rights. And it, it, because of the, the nature of the practice, um, you know, being in a city that's very fast paced and hot composting slows everything down for you. Uh, and it gives you time to reflect upon that. And I think as people who grow gardeners, presumably everybody here is interested in gardening in some way. Um, I think it offers those of us who are settlers uh, an excellent opportunity, but also responsibility through our growing and our composting to, to, to learn about these issues and think about these issues um, in more deep ways uh, and to take, to take action. So thank you, Marissa, for that acknowledgement earlier. Um, basics of hot composting. Well, you heard in that video a few times the word microbe, microbe, microbe. And you're like, I, I thought I was here for a composting workshop and all he's talked about is microbes so far. Um, Dallin, if you could go on to the next slide, please. I'd like to start with a quote um, by a farmer named Grace Gershuni who, who wrote a book called Feeding the Soil on the Organic Farm. Uh, and she's also responsible for uh, the edits to what I would consider uh, an excellent, excellent book for anybody that wants to read about this subject more deeply, the Rodale Book of Composting. Extremely thorough, um, written in the earlier part of the 20th century, and Grace Gershuni was one of the people who updated this book for sort of contemporary times. And she says, the compost maker is a farmer of microbes, no less a farmer than a dairy farmer or a vegetable grower. 
And so I think it's helpful for us right from the get-go of this workshop to be thinking about um, non-human partners and a stewardship of life rather than maybe uh, our mindset in the past was that composting was about death, was about decaying old organic matter, organic matter that had died. And now it was, you know, now it, it's going to do something, something mysterious. Uh, and then the circle of life might continue again. And I think the shift in perspective from a process of death to a, a process of, of thriving and living uh, is an important one um, for us to kind of have our heads wrapped around at the beginning of this workshop on hot composting. Next slide, please. So presumably everybody here has some sort of interest or relationship or awareness uh, of, of what compost is, what composting is. Um, and I, I don't want to disappoint anybody at this time, uh, but hot composting is a particular method that is very labor intensive. So, um, you know, right away, if you're looking for something in your own practice uh, of gardening or growing that is, uh, a, you know, a passive process or something that we can just sort of forget about, hot composting probably isn't going to be for you. Nonetheless, I hope in going through this workshop that you can take a bit, uh, a bit more away about what composting is and, and how it works um, and why this hot composting, uh, quote unquote, California method um, has certain benefits to it. So why hot composting? First of all, because in the process of creating our compost pile, um, you are reaching temperatures in excess of 135 Fahrenheit, 140 Fahrenheit. And in doing so, you can kill um, pathogens, uh, non-desirable bacteria and fungi uh, that are in um, your, your decaying material, and that would be harmful to plants. And in many cases, you can kill um, weed seeds. So if you're composting weeds um, and throwing them into your bin, a hot composting practice can um, render those ineffective. Render, and, and so you're not going to be spreading weed seed around your garden, which in turn reduces labor on down the road. So in a certain way, if you put a, some labor into your composting process, um, you, you can uh, reduce maybe some of your weeding process later on. Number two, in a hot composting process, it encourages a certain diversity of microbes. And we're going to talk a little bit more about um, who, who these uh, micro players are right, you know, uh, in a little bit. But for now, just to say diversity of microbes is um, what we're after in a hot composting process, particularly because the more we learn about soil microbiomes, the more we realize that it's actually the microbes in the soil that do the work rather than sort of traditional understandings of uh, NPK um, say that is what makes the plants grow. Okay, so we're shifting away in a certain way from a, a chemistry based understanding of growing to one that's to do more with microbiology. Hot composting can accelerate your decomposition process. Um, traditional composting can take upwards of a, of a year um, for a, a pile of material to break down fully so that it can be incorporated into your soil. Um, with hot composting, you can have ready, uh, ready to use compost in as little as four weeks. Um, now, always the longer you allow compost to mature, um, you know, the more stable it will be and the more diverse uh, your microbial population will be that you're uh, going to turn into your soil. But you can have um, finished organic matter that is composted ready in four weeks. And this offers uh, permaculture possibilities then. Um, the organic matter that's coming uh, off of your space, um, whether it's a backyard or if you're in a building or whatnot, and, and permaculture can be extended in an urban context to your entire neighborhood. Uh, so where you're getting leaves from a neighbor, you're getting perhaps eggshells from somebody else and coffee grounds from the shop on the corner and so on and so forth. That permaculture idea of how do we take what's on hand um, and use it to feed soil rather than feeding plants. Okay, next slide, please. So we're going to talk today about the typical backyard Dalek style. We can call this a, a, a Dalek or a compost bin, the earth machine, 
um, uh, you know, the shape that municipalities were, were giving out uh, a number of years ago and now they're for sale. You can find a lot of these used on, on Kijiji or on various marketplace groups. Um, but the idea with a, a, a type of a composting system you can use um, is, is less to do with the bin itself and more to do with the size of a pile. Okay, traditionally with a hot composting quote unquote California method, you are looking for something in the neighborhood of one cubic yard in size. Okay, so that would be a three feet high by three feet wide by three feet deep um, pile of material. And that allows for a sufficient density of organic material to create an almost a, an internal combustion reaction for lack of a better term. Okay, we're gonna get into more of what that combustion reaction is in a few slides from now. But suffice it to say for now, what we're talking about here, whether we're talking windrows, which are basically like um, long piles that a farmer might put in a, in a, a larger open field, um, wide long piles. Uh, many of you are familiar with a three bin system, which are, are three compartments, three usually wooden compartments um, that are about a cubic yard in each compartment. And you can start by building a pile in the first compartment moving it into the second compartment kind of at the, the halfway point before finally moving it into the third compartment to cure. Daleks, these are the earth machine bins that you see here in the photo. Um, some of you may be familiar with barrel shaped um, tumblers uh, that would have sort of a hand crank um, that you put material in to get a composting um, practice started. And then we're not going to talk about vermicomposting here today, but obviously that's a separate kind of composting practice um, that, that might be suitable for, for your own particular interests or needs. With this kind of composting we're talking about right now, uh, again, we're focusing on this earth machine because it's a very common sort of backyard size um, setup. And we want to show that we can do hot composting in here, even though it's less than one cubic yard in size. Okay, next slide, please. I do see some of these questions coming up in chat right now. So uh, I'm, I haven't answered them yet, but I promise to try and get to all of them uh, as we move forward in, in the presentation. Okay, um, the, the key with, as I mentioned already, the key with a hot composting pile is um, a balance of materials, okay? We wanna think about this like we're making a recipe, okay? So pretend we're in the kitchen right now but instead of, you know, instead of making, you know, a bread or some kind of baked good, we are going to try and strike the right ingredient mix in order to achieve a combustion reaction. Okay. And again, combustion is not the right word, but it, it's helpful for us here in terms of we know when it's heated up um, and, and to, to achieve these temperatures. We need to create a certain mix of materials. Number one, um, is the, the organic materials themselves, okay? You will, you'll hear me talk about uh, two different kinds of materials. The first is what we call browns, uh, colloquially or anecdotally we'll call browns. Um, and these are our sort of carbon, high carbon um, based materials like leaves, straw, um, wood chips, sawdust, and so on and so forth, okay? The flip side are our greens. And these are our nitrogen-based materials. Um, and these would be things like your kitchen scraps, coffee grounds, green grass clippings, um, blood meal, and so on and so forth. And if you go on any Google search, you can easily find tables of, um, of different materials that would fall under the green or brown category. And sometimes it's a little confusing. I mean, obviously coffee grounds look brown, um, but green refers less to what they look like and more um, whether they're very high in nitrogen or whether they're very high in carbon. And we need a balance of the carbon and nitrogen to come together um, for this reaction to take place. Now, traditionally we would say, oh, in the, in the, in the chemistry perspective of things, it's actually carbon and nitrogen that are coming together and combusting. That's not necessarily true. What's actually happening, and going back to our microbes again, is that uh, bacteria are going to come in and feed on your nitrogen heavy um, 
uh, feedstocks. And in doing so, they are going to decompose those stocks, break them down into um, less complex materials and release heat in the process. And that's when the pile starts to heat up. Fungi start to come over, start to come in and uh, dominate the pile a bit more, as well as what we refer to as heat loving or thermophilic bacteria. So a different sort of class of bacteria comes in and they start to break down the woody material, the carbon-based material. So rather than the C and the N coming together and, and forming a chemical reaction, it's actually these non-human microbial partners um, that are doing kind of this invisible uh, decomposing and building block work, tearing it apart and building up other complex chains, proteins, et cetera, from the pile. Now, this is only possible especially in the California method, with two further conditions. Number one is, uh, sorry, can we go to the next slide, please, Dal? Okay, sorry, we just talked about carbons and nitrogen. Here's brown and greens. Okay, I'll, I'll talk about the other two conditions in a second. Uh, this gives you some examples of, of these tables that we're referring to, okay? And one thing I'd like to talk a little bit about with hot composting, because obviously after this, workshop, if you're interested, you're going to go back to Google and refresh yourselves and, and do a little bit more reading. And you're going to be wondering about the ratio, the carbon to nitrogen ratio. And essentially, you'll see that you're looking for a ratio of approximately 25 to 1 to 30 to 1 carbons to nitrogens. Okay, so that can lead us mistakenly to think, okay, I need 30 times as much leaves as I do fruit and veggie scraps to make my pile. That's not true. Um, if you look at these ratios, you see even the green material on the right, uh, it has carbon as well, okay? So your grass clippings at 19 to one, that means it's got 19 parts carbon to one part nitrogen, okay? All of our organic matter in the world has carbon in it. We are, you know, we're carbon-based life, life forms. And so all, all the things listed here are going to have carbon. Um, but if it has less than 30 to one carbon ratio, carbon to nitrogen rate ratio, we consider these nitrogen rich feedstocks and they will balance out the ones that are higher than 30 to one, like leaves, tree bark, et cetera, um, that, that have a much higher or greater uh, carbon content to them. Okay, so what we try to do essentially is balance out our ratios so that our final ratio ends up being about 30 to 1. For example, if we take something like grass clippings, which are 19 to 1, and let's just call it 20 um, for the sake of ease of numbers, and we take leaves on the other hand that are approximately 40 to 1, to achieve a final balance of 30 to 1, we essentially want equal amounts of grass clippings and leaves. So by weight, by, by, sorry, by volume, we're going to want about equal amounts. So people say, what, what do I put in my bin when I'm trying to do a hot compost bin? It's about 50-50, it may be slightly 60-40. You're gonna to start to get a feel for it over time, depending on exactly what greens you're using and exactly what browns you're using. Um, you would not want to, uh, or you, you can, sorry, I shouldn't say you would not want to. If that's what you have on hand, you use what you have on hand. The better you can incorporate multiple greens as well as multiple browns together, the more richness and diversity of microbes that you're going to encourage. And again, if we think about ourselves as quote unquote farmers and microbes, what we're seeking to achieve here is less a quantity as much as a diversity or a quality. Okay. So hopefully this helps um, a, a confusing part about ratios, which is Sean said 50-50, but the ratios say 30 to one. 30 to one is how much carbon you want in there relative to your nitrogen, but by volume, it's probably gonna be close to 50-50 to get started. And as you get more experience at it, you'll kind of get a feel for um, how this is decomposing and, and how I should have balanced the pile uh, based on what kind of feedstocks I had available to me. Okay, next slide, please. 
the two other ingredients that I started to allude to before I never, never finally came back to are oxygen and water, aeration and moisture. This hot composting reaction does not take place in the absence of aeration um, and in the absence of water. The, 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 um, the microbes cannot break down. Um, they cannot fully break down the materials in the, the nitrogen feedstock and particularly the carbon-based feedstock if there is not uh, water there to help the chemical reactions. And most of the microbes that we're interested in, um, not only for our compost, but we hear this often in gardening as well for our plants, is aeration. Our, our plants need to breathe, our soils need to breathe, we need to get air down to the roots. Um, and if we have piles that are too compacted, just like if we have soils that are too compacted, um, aerobic microbes aren't there. They're not alive. They're not living. And so to get the beneficials that we're looking for, the aerobic microbes, we need to have structure in our pile in some way um, so that air can flow through a little bit. And there's different ways we can do that. Um, one thing we can, we can say is uh, we can use bulking agents. And bulking agents are just sort of the structural way we have material to allow pore spaces for air to, to pass through in the pile, okay? Um, we can achieve this by something like adding wood chips versus adding sawdust. Both of them are browns, both of them with high C ratio, but the structure of them are two very different things. And if we were to put together a pile of sawdust with a pile of coffee grounds, um, it would get compacted extremely quickly and it's going to turn anaerobic um, and, 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 you know, anaerobic microbes are going to thrive and, and not be so great for your plants. Okay, so to have structure in there, whether that is at the beginning of your pile, at the bottom of your composter, um, you know, building a little uh, kind of teepee shape with sticks um, that, that allows kind of like a little uh, uh, vacuum space underneath for, for oxygen to kind of come up underneath the pile so that it doesn't collapse on itself. And eventually that's going to decay, but by that point you've gone through your hot phase um, and it, you don't need to worry about it. You can add chips um, to your pile. You can, uh, I mentioned farmers would use big long windrows that would be maybe five feet high, you know, five feet, eight feet wide, and they would just have these large um, compost piles and often they would run perforated pipes um, through the pile so that air can passively pass through the bottom, the interior of the pile and make sure that it's oxygenated at all times. Um, larger industrial composters would use various active, um, active air systems uh, where air is being you know, pumped underneath a compost pile uh, via a series of uh, pipes and manifold valves so that it, it eventually comes up through the pile. The point of all this is to say, your pile needs oxygen. The final way is the most important way. Um, and this is why I said at the beginning of the outset of the presentation that this is a laborious process. We need to turn, we need to turn this pile. And that means taking the lid off, getting the pitchfork in and taking the whole thing, dumping it out and turning it back over again. Or if we're running a three bin system, moving everything from pile one or, or sorry, bay one into bay two, and in doing so, that's going to remix the material. That's going to open up new pore spaces and uh, re-expose um, all the material that's decomposing in your bin to oxygen once again. Okay, so there are passive ways to introduce oxygen and there are active ways to introduce oxygen as well. Moisture, your pile should be, especially when you started out, um, as damp as a wet sponge, okay? If you were to take a handful of your, your material and squeeze it, you know, just you just get a drop of water out of it, okay? That's how wet it needs to be. And so um, when, when people who are kind of like passive backyard composters say, hey, I've thrown all these weeds in a bin and, you know, kind of left them there for a while, part of why you know, that the breakdown never actually happens is it's too dry. 
okay? It, it, you know, it will happen on a long enough timeline, everything decomposes, right? Um, but if you want usable compost in a season or, or over the winter for the spring, you need to have some moisture in there for the microbes to be able to do the breakdown work. At the beginning in a hot composting process, a wet, almost like a sponge. And then as you monitor your pile, you'll see in a couple of days that um, within the first three days, that pile is gonna reduce by about a quarter, okay? As the, the, the reactions start to take place, that volume starts to, to reduce. Um, and it can start to dry out. You'll start to see, if you haven't watered enough, you'll see that parts of your pile are dry on top. And you want to rewater again, because if the moisture is not there, spots can turn anaerobic once again and, uh, and grow different kinds of um, non-beneficial anaerobic bacteria. Okay, slide please, down. So there are three phases to a hot composting reaction and you can imagine, um, you can imagine this kind of a, a graph. Now I'm, I'm kind of reversed, I guess, on your cameras, but you know, imagine a little graph of uh, temperature over time. So time kind of going on your x-axis and, and temperature going on your y-axis. And what's gonna happen is uh, in the first few days, monophilic means nothing's happening. It's sort of single, single variety of bacteria um, uh, are, are you know, active in the pile, not much is going on. Mesophilic is when that initial reaction starts to take place. And you see it here in the green zone. Um, you see a pile, mesophilic and active, and that's happening around 40 degrees. Somebody asked about Celsius earlier. It's happening around 40 degrees Celsius, 110 Fahrenheit. Um, the pile is starting to warm up. And that's when these early mesophilic bacteria are starting to break down the nitrogen in the pile, as I mentioned before, okay? It's the easiest, most readily available feedstock for the microbes to, um, to consume. As that happens, and, and this, their lifespans are, are all about kind of quick replication and self-reproduction. Uh, and so they're consuming these uh, nitrogen stores and the temperature is rising in the pile and we start to enter at about 130, 135 degrees Fahrenheit or 50, 52 Celsius, uh, what's called a thermophilic phase. And at the thermophilic phase, the compost is literally quite hot. You'll see steam coming off it. Um, you know, you can, you won't burn yourself if you plunge your hand in, but experienced composters can kind of reach their hand in uh, and know that their, their compost is sufficiently um, heating up. And, uh, and basically a different set of bacteria and fungi start to dominate the pile and they are breaking down the more complex um, uh, materials that are in your woody uh, tree-like matter, your, your straw, your um, wood chips, your leaves, etc. cetera. And, and this releases heat. I mean, the cellulose content, the lignin content of these materials is such that they're uh, hard to break down, but when they do break down, um, you, you're able, they're able to form, we are not, they are able to form um, new organic compounds, new protein chains, etc. And then eventually that thermophilic phase is going to subside. Um, in, you, you want to have your pile hopefully over um, that 135 barrier for about three days. Although the larger the pile, that can be maintained for upwards of six months. And in fact, there are, there are some people experimenting with doing passive heating of um, of homes, uh, certainly of greenhouses. Uh, we're hoping to do an experiment here in Toronto this winter uh, where we where we heat a greenhouse um, with a, a large enough compost pile that the reaction can be sustained over over six months um, and then run passive water heating um, through a greenhouse to be able to grow year round. Uh, so we'll cross our fingers on that one. But there are people anyways, you get the idea. The temperatures are sufficient enough and they can be maintained through the winter uh, with a big enough pile that, um, that we can do something with this heat. We can, we can really do something with it. Okay, next slide. 
So I mentioned some little tweaks. Uh, I talked about maybe building little structures with sticks to, to provide um, aeration underneath. And, and one thing I found is a little bit easier is, uh, um, you know, I'm a curb hunter. Uh, I see things like old dish racks on the side of the curb all the time, or, you know, little, um, you know, vegetable crispers from an old fridge. This stuff is, is on your curb all the time. And, and, and composting is a DIY dream paradise. If you're into that kind of stuff, um, uh, there are so many different ways you can work with the technique. Okay, so this is something I've started using uh, quite often over the last year and a half, uh, you know, taking old dish racks and stuff and turning them upside down to provide a little bit of a basket um, and, a, and a vacuum space for air to stay, uh, a, an air pocket to stay underneath. And the way somebody described this to me was, think about um, if you have a fireplace and quite often we will build our fires in a fireplace inside one of those little kind of like metal baskets um, which sort of props up your wood and allows air to come in underneath and you can think about this in similar terms next slide please uh, and, and coupled with this um, little technique here which was a, an insulator mat that was built out of um, again just simple materials found scrap on the curb it was a uh, uh, you know pipe insulator bubble wrap um, and old carpet, um, and then just kind of duct tape together to create this sort of like thick uh, insulator barrier to keep heat in and, and sustain the, the thermophilic phase as long as possible. And so this is uh, when Marissa mentioned the, the innovation award earlier, this is part of the innovation award was how could we make little tweaks to a backyard bin so that we could contrary to the popular wisdom of the California method, which was you need a full cubic yard of material and a, a, a cubic yard for, for metric terms, a cubic yard is uh, 760 liters of, of material. Um, one of these earth machine bins only holds 300 liters of material. So you're talking 40 to 45% of the volume of the full cubic yard California method requires. So our question was in a backyard context, could we have a California hot composting style reaction with 40 to 45% of the volume? The insulator cover, the, the pocket underneath. And then the, the third thing I do is because I'm brewing compost tea all the time, I was pouring some of the compost tea back in as a method of um, adding moisture to the pile when I was building the pile. And for those of you who make sourdough bread, or kombucha, this would be a familiar um, practice, right? You're adding starter back into your next recipe. Um, and so I would always do that with compost tea, but I would recommend even if you don't make compost tea to always hold back, you know, a little shovel full of your old compost from the last batch, um, hold back a, a shovel full of soil from your garden or something to that effect so that you are inoculating beneficial microbes into your new pile like a sourdough or kombucha, okay? So anything you can do to insulate or keep the heat in on top, uh, creating a pocket of air underneath and using a starter to inoculate beneficial microbes can be ways of achieving hot composting, um, even in a backyard composter. Next slide, please. Okay, well, we've talked about the microbes uh, already quite a bit. Who are some of the other non-human partners that are involved in this process? Um, number one, we can think of uh, insects the, that are shredders, okay? You'll find a lot of sow bugs, millipedes. Um, I'm not gonna be able to name them all right now. A lot of what they're doing is uh, not only doing chemical reactions with, with um, the, the material itself, but they actually do a physical process where they're um, on a micro scale shredding material and making it even smaller. And so when I say that, hey, we can get a usable compost within four weeks, typically it's still going to look um, a little bit chunky and, and it's something that you might want to apply as a top mulch to your garden beds. The longer you wait, the more these insects are going to come and uh, you know spend time in your pile they are going to take those even what are small chunks and make them even smaller. They're going to 
to shred through them. The bacteria and fungi are going to continue to do their work. And then we see the worms here are also going to enter your pile once the thermophilic phase is done. The more you can create conditions for um, uh, a healthy pile with lots of microbes, that's what worms are coming in to feed on is bacteria and fungi um, and, and uh, in, in that wake. And so for those of you who are vermicomposters, this will be very familiar for you. You're, you're looking to create the conditions for bacteria and fungi so that your worms are happy, not the other way around. Um, and the worms that are typical colonizers of, of compost piles are red wigglers. Um, and you'll see them, they're about uh, a few inches long, deep red in color, um, and, and they are, you know, compost worms. Do I need to buy compost worms to compost outdoors? The answer is no. Um, you need to buy compost worms if you want to vermicompost in a bin. Uh, if you create nice piles outside, the worms will come to you. Um, and in fact, seeing uh, in a maturing pile after that sort of first thermophilic phase has subsided, seeing worms start to come and visit is a sign that you've done something, uh, something, done something well. Okay, pests, other non-human partners. Um, you know, one of the main reasons people are adverse to composting in their backyard um, is because of pests and others, you know, what are termed vectors. And this is a true thing, okay? Um, and it's certainly become more true over the last year with COVID. Uh, where restaurants have been shut down and those sort of easy access sources of a meal um, in back alleys of, of restaurants are gone or they're reduced or diminished. Um, you know, I, I, I can say without a doubt over the last year, I've seen more raccoons um, around where I live than I ever have in the past. Uh, and so, you know, it's a real thing at this time, um, you know, pests have, have kind of changed their patterns over the last year. The best way to manage this with um, uh, composting is whenever you're adding green material, kitchen scraps to a pile, add some browns right away, okay? Whether we're talking hot composting or not, or if you're just the kind of person who wants someplace to dump their kitchen scraps in a very passive cold composting fashion, always add browns at the same time. Think about it for those of you who have ever used a composting toilet before. Um, once you do your business, you're putting sawdust on right away. Um, and, and that sort of mitigates, um, you know, mitigates odors and things like that. Similarly, if you put some brown material on your fresh kitchen scrap green material right away, uh, you can practice what Lorraine Johnson refers to as good compost hygiene. One thing I haven't really mentioned yet, and I should have at the outset, um, or maybe I do on the next slide. Dallin, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, next slide after that. We can skip this one for now. We can skip this one for now. <laughs> the, okay, sourcing feedstocks. This is what I wanted to get to. Um, one thing I haven't mentioned yet is not only is this a laborious practice, but the California method requires you to build your pile all at once. Okay, so that can be a detriment for some people because it will require um, hanging on to feedstocks for a long period of time in order to build that pile all at once. And if your primary motivation for composting is to dispose of kitchen scraps, this can be problematic. Um, so having a bin where you can kind of add compost as you go and put sawdust on it or straw on it as you go um, can be a nice complement to then saving other types of feedstocks like leaves or coffee grounds to build a pile all at once. And then incorporating that partly finished kitchen scrap material into your bin when you're building your big pile. But the whole idea of the California method, again, is size, volume, and density, okay? And so that entire pile has to be built at once in order for the heat to be achieved, that critical mass to be achieved and sustained over a period of time. You won't get it in your backyard if you're um, doing a composting that is kind of like, every day I take out my veggies and then I put in some straw or sawdust 
And, and that works as well. And there's nothing wrong with that method. It's just, it won't achieve what you want it to achieve if it's building a whole hot pile at once. And so I, you know, I talked to everybody at the beginning of, of composting workshops to say, what is your motivation for composting and to work backwards from there? Is it, is it to have somewhere to put your kitchen scraps that's not the green bin? Is it um, that you want to make your own compost and have control over that, that process? Um, is it you know, something that you wanna put a lot of time and effort in and sort of work with like a recipe? Or is it something that you wanna just sort of chuck stuff in a bin and forget about? Uh, and all of those have different answers for what kind of method might be best for you. Kitchen scraps, if you want a passive way to process kitchen scraps, vermicomposting might be the best way. Um, you know, if you've got a sufficient number of worms, they can be the ones that can, can uh, process um, all of your sort of kitchen residue in a way that uh, doesn't require active turning, active building of a big pile, but will also keep pests at bay. Because if rats want in, they will get in. They will chew through wire, they will chew through plastic. And so your technique is more important to keeping rats away than which method you choose ultimately in the end. Sourcing feedstocks. Um, if we're gonna build a pile all at once, then the question is, what are we going to use? How are we gonna balance our carbons and, and nitrogens, our greens and our browns? Okay, and where are we gonna store things? Like what are, what are we gonna do for timing so that everything is ready to have this quantity? And as I mentioned, uh, 300 liters worth. Um, so approximately 15, five gallon buckets of material ready to go at that one time and uh, one point in time. Your neighborhood is gonna have everything you need. Um, well, depending on where you live, but if you're in a city like Toronto, your neighborhood has everything you need. There, there are lawn clippings, there are you know, um, trimmings from a garden, there, there are uh, leaves, there are coffee grounds at the coffee shop, so on and so forth. If you're creative about it, your neighborhood is everything you need. The question is, how do you get all those things to your place? What are the flows of material to get feedstocks to you? How do you do it at a certain time and have that pile ready to go? Okay, um, and hopefully if, if uh, we have a little time at the end, uh, and maybe if we don't have time, I'd like to encourage everybody to, when you're done the workshop and have a minute, to diagram your space, uh, draw a little picture of your space and um, you know where you grow, where you would compost, and what space you have to reserve materials, and then draw some arrows around your neighborhood or where you can get some of the other feedstocks, where you can source water. Um, does your hose, if you use a hose, does your hose reach all the way back to your pile, or are you gonna have to cart water back there? Um, so on and so forth. You want, obviously you wanna keep your compost bin as far away from your house as possible, um, you don't want it to be, you know, your, your plants hopefully are going to get the prime sun area. So it's going to be in the shadow somewhere, blah, 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 blah. And to start thinking through this, like where in this diagram am I going to have a composter, uh, get water, um, store things and to make this more of an active process for myself. Okay. Next slide, please. Um, and the finished compost, we talked about this already. Uh, the, the, the cycle can be done in as little as four weeks, okay? The key is the building the pile all at once, trying to maintain as much heat as possible, um, and, uh, and actively turning and monitoring the moisture so that um, the, the, the reaction can sustain itself and um, the heat can stay in the thermophilic range as long as possible for all that material to be broken down. Now, um, the longer you cure it is always better. And in fact, uh, if, you, if you do end up trying hot composting, um, to do a pile in the fall, you know, when all the leaves come in and, and you can source leaves very easily. I'm that guy who's like grabbing yard waste bags from the neighborhood and, and going to the kids' playground and, you know, or the school and grabbing leaves. Uh, and you've got all this and you build your, your sort of your fall pile and you can go through that hot composting curve 
before it gets too cold in uh, November and December. Okay, eight minutes. Um, and, and you've got a finished compost and you could put it on right then, but it's amazing when you leave that through the winter and you come back in the spring and, and the, the remarkable difference um, where the longer curing time allows for so much of a, of a more mature and broken down crumbly compost. And I think we're almost at the end anyways, Dallin, could you just uh, click to the next slide, please? Yeah, personal plans. I, I hope everybody has a chance to, to drop a little personal plan for themselves, uh, diagram your space um, and diagram it not only as sort of like static entities, like here's the compost bin, here is the hose or whatnot, but also to, to draw in your flows as well. Where am I getting this um, feedstock from? And so on and so forth. Okay, that's it for me right now. I saw a bunch of things come up in the chat and hopefully I can uh, answer as many of those questions as possible right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Sean. That was very informative. I'm, I'm gonna read out some questions to you so you don't have to search for them all. Okay. <laughs>